Good evening, everybody. I uh, didn't expect this kind of setup, to tell you the truth. It's kind of an early Christmas, at least when I uh, think of my kids. I think they're going to be really mad tomorrow that I did, did not take them uh, with me tonight. But, you know, let's not just, let's not talk about Christmas just yet. I have an enormous reverb here on stage. Do you have a monitor here? It's very hard to speak like that. Do you? Okay. So let's not talk about Christmas just yet, but you know, January is approaching very fast too, as you all know, and I'm sure most of you, some of you at least, um, are already considering which kind of detox you are going to opt for in January during the first month of the year. So maybe no alcohol after a week of family feasts. Um, and then New Year's Eve on top of that, maybe no binge watching of TV shows that basically all run on the same principle, right? In every episode, things will take a turn for the worse, as if um, watching, reading the news didn't give you enough of that already at the time. So maybe no more doom scrolling on your smartphones. A more radical type of detox, discipline your smartphone use, maybe limit it to a time frame during the day, digital detox, you've all heard the term before. So I do really hear, uh, hear that often, but I seldom see it, let alone do it myself. All of this then will be repeated again in spring when, you know, fasting for Easter comes around, of course, uh, so it's going to be, you know, field one again, at least if you're Christian or are immersed in a predominantly Judeo Christian culture like many of us are here tonight, I believe. And it's probably quite safe to say that many of us feel bad about their smartphone use or have felt bad about it at some time in their life. Many feel overwhelmed, so to speak, a bit like tourists felt in inner cities in the 80s before they got so extensively gentrified. Think of New York. Think of New York City. You know, like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five were rapping in a seminal hip-hop track from 1982, too much, too many people, too much. I'm quoting a little bit more of that. I'm definitely am not a rapper, but just to give you the general idea of a Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five we're rapping about. I got a bad habit and I just can't break it. Something's in my mind and I just can't shake it. I need some time and I want some space. I gotta get away from the human race. If you think you're using too much, of the smartphone, that is, and if you think the smartphone alienates you from other people, this is your night. Um, not because you're going to be, you know, reinforced in that feeling, because every known guest will bring at least some relief, actually, to that sentiment, to this remorse. He will be presenting a much more positive view on digital technology than what we are used to in this series, you know, that's been running for six years now. How fittingly, then, here, at Naturkunde Museum, uh, Museum of Natural Sciences or Natural History, we will also learn that smartphones are actually part of being human, may I say, become part of nature or second nature that will have to be discussed. So a warm welcome at last now to this third and also last session of Making Sense of the Digital Society this year. It is, as you probably know, we have uh, several guests who have come around for a long time. It is a joint venture between the Federal Agency for Civic Education and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. So after the lecture that will begin any minute now, there's going to be the conversation on stage between our guests and myself for maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. There's two microphones on, on the two floors, so to speak. I uh, hope you can see us very in the back. This is quite, quite a hike to you guys back there in the row, but there's going to be microphones. And there's also going to be a um, digital participatory tool, as always, called Slido. So very warm welcome to our viewers on their respective screens at home. This is, of course, being live streamed on the respective websites and also at Alex TV Berlin. So welcome to you at home or wherever you are. And of course, the warmest welcome to our guest from England now. He is an anthropologist at University College London, where he founded the Digital Anthropology Program. He has studied the relationships we develop to things, cars, clothes, gear of all types, and yes, to smartphones. In the last 20 years, he has pioneered the studies in digital anthropology 
And being an anthropologist, he not only listens to what people say about what they are doing, like feeling bad about their smartphone use, but he actually examines what people do, uh, like using it all the time, and um, surprisingly in uh, innovative ways, as we were going to hear tonight. So this is definitely one crucial difference to the constant, I would like to call it, survey mania we get in the media. So we mostly, you know, most of the time you only hear what people say in a very short time span, answering questions we don't know or don't even care to know about what they were in the first place. Our speaker tonight, the fellow of the British Academy, um, has been head of many research projects around the globe on how people of various age and cultural background interact with smartphones. He will tell you about that himself in a moment. But let me just briefly hint at the great access to these studies. You can get all the volumes uh, of his research for free in open access formats if you read the small print he wrote me in an email last week. I was actually able to read the small print. I had to put my other glasses on, but I succeeded eventually and could download some of them. If you would like to read a summary of sorts um, of all those studies, uh, you might want to start with um, the global smartphone beyond a youth technology 2021 at UCL Press. He's also published on health topics such as the comfort of people in 2017, which was based on a study of the social relations and communications of hospice patients in the UK of people about to die. In other words, very fresh from the press, so to speak, and yet again as open access, if you wish, The Good Enough Life, a book that combines philosophical questions about the good life with ethnographical research in a small Irish town whose name I won't dare to mispronounce. I just learned now before this introduction that it's actually very easy to pronounce. It's called Cúin, uh, meaning port. Uh, so to speak. That's just a brief glimpse at about three books of a total, I think, of 41 books he has edited and or written in the past decades. But hear him in the flesh now in his lecture, The Global Evolution of Smart Technologies. Please welcome Daniel Miller. Thank you very much indeed, and I'm really delighted to be here um, in this amazing setting. Um, it's, it's a museum, but I, I must admit I'm not actually going to be focusing on the past very much tonight, or indeed actually on the future. This is really a talk about the, the present um, and about a device which is extraordinary, that is global and ubiquitous, that we all kind of use, the smartphone. And my main question tonight is, who put the smart into the smartphone? Having said that, there is a kind of analogy with uh, evolution, since the global development um, of the smartphone is kind of a bit like an adapt species adaptation to a local cultural ecology. I think smartphones and Darwin's finches, yeah, they have quite a bit in common. Now, much of what I will provide tonight is a summary of 10 years of anthropological research on the use and consequences of social media and smartphones. Research that shows the extraordinary contribution that has been made by you. That is, the users of these platforms and devices. A contribution that has rarely been properly acknowledged. So mostly, I will be making the case that it is you who have made the smartphone smart. But we are also in Berlin, and I actually couldn't resist the temptation to start and end this talk from a rather different set of observations. Last week, I published this book, The Good Enough Life, and much of the volume consists of a debate between anthropology and Western philosophy, much of which comes from Germany. And I want to suggest that one of the reasons that we tend to diminish our own contribution to the smart in the smartphone lies actually in modern philosophy. Now, I imagine it's reasonably conventional to start a consideration of modern philosophy with the work of Immanuel Kant. 
And although his best-known work is the critique of pure reason, his critique of practical reason, concerned with moral issues, has also been immensely influential. And I think it's also pretty conventional to suggest that Kant was concerned to ensure that advances in Enlightenment philosophy and incipient science should not overturn the foundations of our moral principles, which suggests a certain conservative agenda, fearful of what these new developments might mean for the core values we associate with being human. Following the time of Kant, the rise of science and technology gathered momentum, and later philosophers seem to have become still more fearful of their consequences. For example, Adorno and Heidegger don't seem to have liked each other very much, but they shared a very similar pessimism and condemnation of technological developments. Reading Adorno and Horkheimer's work, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, today is really quite shocking. It's an extraordinarily elitist work that assumes populations such as us have absolutely no capacity to resist the techno-capitalist structures that create mass culture as a kind of bread and circuses. We don't even see our oppression, we're so thoroughly seduced by things like cheap entertainment. Try to imagine, if you will, how Adorno and Horkheimer would have responded to TikTok. Doesn't bear thinking about. Um, it's rather harder to delve into Heidegger's views, because the writing is a little opaque, to be honest. Um, the concept of Dasein seems to have been driven by a desire to find something so sort of foundational that it could remain unsullied by these sort of modern forms of objectification. Heidegger's later essays on technology are easier to read, and his fundamental conservatism becomes still more evident. Also, probably not going to be a fan of TikTok. In other words, much of modern philosophy has a conservative, nostalgic, and often highly elitist tone that seems disdainful of our capacities to deal with developments in technology and science. This matters to the degree that philosophy matters, that it seems to have set the tone for academic work, such as in social science, and more generally establishing a dominant discourse which is inclined to assume that new developments in media and technology will result in some kind of loss of humanity. At the conclusion of this talk, I will return to philosophy in order to think more deeply about what my discussion of the smartphone says about what we understand it means to be a human being. Evidence for the idea that philosophy has established a dominant discourse comes from what would otherwise be a rather astonishing finding for my 10 years of research. The first five years, comprised a team of, of anthropologists studying the use and consequences of social media and was called Why We Post. And as you can see, we were sort of distributed all around the world. And that was also true of the second five-year project, which was called ASA, the, oops, the Anthropology of um, Smartphones and Smart Aging. In almost every region where we worked, we found this extraordinary discrepancy between what people say about smartphones in general um, and what they actually do with smartphones. So if you ask somebody about smartphones, um, the response is almost always negative. Yes, as was just suggested, they tell you smartphones are addictive, and perhaps we do need a, a detox period at Christmas or Easter or some other time, um, doing without the smartphones. They believe that smartphones are changing our cognitive capacities. We're losing our attention span. They talk about filter bubbles and fake news and other ways they believe smartphones are endangering political debate. It seems that People, like us, have developed many versions of this fundamental philosophical concern that new technology is resulting in some sort of loss of humanity. For example, that people are now orientated to screens as opposed to people, which is an example of what we might mean by this word objectification. And yet, if you turn from what people say they do, 
to what they do, you find almost the exact opposite sentiments. Now, our studies are unusual because they are not primarily based on language. Our main evidence is not what people say in interviews or surveys or focus groups. All the researchers in my teams lived inside communities in different field sites around the world, each for 16 months, where they could concentrate on observation, seeing what people do. When we did interview, we didn't just ask about the smartphone in general, but went through every single app on the smartphone in turn to learn how each was used and why. Instead of talking about smartphones, we'd end up talking about things going on in their lives or the purposes for which they're using the smartphones. Take, for example, health. How people research symptoms or side effects. You know, as soon as anything happens, you Google it, right? Um, you're, con you're concerned. Or then you might follow uh, physiotherapy exercises on YouTube. Um, who doesn't try and increase their fitness through 10,000 steps? Um, find it easier now to deal maybe with medical insurance or repeat medical prescriptions. And 20 other ways in which we're going to be using those smartphone apps um, to be actually quite useful when it comes to health. Or they might describe um, going on holiday seen through the lens of the smartphone starting with a trip advisor to choose a hotel based on a thousand reviews, then booking the hotel and the flights on their phone. How they use Duolingo to practice the local language and a QR code to board the plane at the airport. Once they arrive, they use Google Maps to find a museum. And, um, and if they then still get lost in the streets, they might use Google Translate to ask somebody about where the museum is, um, as often happens to me. Now, at that point, the idea of a detox from your smartphone, like not using all these apps that clearly make those tasks of life easier and quicker, now that's starting to sound a little strange. So how do we explain why the exact same people are so negative about smartphones in general terms and so positive about what they actually do with smartphones for health, holidays, and a hundred other things? Now perhaps you can see why I started with philosophy. I really do believe that there is a dominant negative discourse that comes from the way powerful forces such as philosophers, intellectuals, and the media teach us what is legitimate to say and what is not acceptable to say. I think this does probably apply to lecture series such as this one. Um, that you, you tend to get the negative stance, that something like Zubov's surveillance capitalism would be typical of what dominates academic writing. A relentless critique that assumes that digital technologies are leading to a loss of humanity in a spirit that follows this kind of conservative philosophy. Of course, what is being said here is important, but it tends to be about the forces that bear down upon people. And surely, we also need some balance based on what we can come to know about the people themselves. So as anthropologists, we would call that a discourse. It's not a description generally of what people do, but a form of moral legitimation. People say what they think you should hear. While we try and participate and observe, to be on people's WhatsApp groups, to be with them when they're dealing with health issues and holidays. From these 10 years of study, we've already published 20 volumes, some you can see there. Um, that is nearly 4,000 pages of evidence. We also work globally. These projects included ethnographies based in China, India, Africa, Latin America, and Europe, so that we can compare contexts. Our suspicion of language extends even to the term smartphone. The word suggests that A, it's a phone, and B, that it's smart. Actually, though, 
young people hardly ever use the thing to make a phone call, and the acronym SMART stands for devices that are able to learn from the way they're being used. And yes, smartphones may try and predict what you're going to do next. But again, this turns out to be quite a minor feature when set in the context of everything else that we're doing with our smartphones. So yes, as in 2021, we published this book called The Global Smartphone. It's a free download available in many languages. The book radically rethinks what a smartphone is. We call it the transportal home. That is, first and foremost, the smartphone is a place within which we now live. Obviously, it's a little different from a bricks and mortar home. But there are many analogies. It's pretty obviously our best address if people want to contact us. We're mostly at home in our transportal home. It's the place where today we might do our research and other kinds of work, the place where we watch, play our entertainment, you know, watch a football match when you're in a queue. It's a place where we organize our lives, the calendars and all the rest of it. It's the place now from where you might go shopping and banking without even leaving this home. It's a trans portal home because it's so easy to portal to somebody else's transportal home and spend time chatting to them and sharing activities without having to drive or take a bus. So this was one of many discoveries that we believe transform our understanding of what this thing is. We argue also that the smartphone changes our relationship to the world around us through a property we call perpetual opportunism. This stems from the fact that it's always with us. On the one hand, the camera has become opportunistic. We can use it the very moment our baby first smiles. Or we pass an advertisement for a concert that we think we might want to go and see. Or we see something curious that we might want to put on Instagram. But equally, a perpetual opportunism in that we can share those images instantly with whoever else we think would certainly be interested in seeing our baby's first smile or the poster for the concert. Another example would be the term beyond anthropomorphism. The smartphone is clearly not anthropomorphic, doesn't have arms, legs, or look much like a person. But actually, it goes well beyond any prior technology in its ability to reflect us, including our individual personality. When I study someone's smartphone, I can tell from this, for example, minimalist approach to its usage, using as few apps as possible, how it can be expressive of a particular kind of masculinity, or how the details of a smartphone reveal one particular individual's sense of themselves as a consummate professional by the way it's been set up to link all sorts of organizational facilities, the, the calendar, the notes, the websites. In this case, it was expressing somebody who felt that their workplace hadn't recognized how a professional they really were. So they expressed it in their phone that they had, in a sense, created. It needn't be individual. Smartphones are a very revealing of relationships. Older couples, where well, it doesn't matter who has the banking app, because they pick up each other's phones. Or you can see that the grandchild borrowed the phone to play games. How did all that happen? My son is a software engineer, and I don't want to disparage the craft that produced the technology. They provided us with moments of absolute magic. Remember the first time you tried out the original iPhone, or perhaps recently your first attempts to play with ChatGPT? They're marvelous, and we do marvel at them. Yet the real gift from software engineers such as my son has been a form of modesty. They built something that is unprecedented in the degree to which it can be altered and appropriated by the user, rather than controlling the user as technology. 
I don't deny all the problematic consequences of smartphones and surveillance capitalism and the rest of it. But in some ways, I would assert the other side to Zabov. The way we as users and consumers manipulate the tech is generally far more consequential than the way the tech manipulates us as consumers. And that is what our 4,000 pages of evidence suggests. Now, this is where you come into the picture. I don't know anyone who just gets a smartphone and uses it. The day it arrives, most people are busy deleting apps, often the ones the companies wanted us to use. Who here purchased a Samsung Galaxy and actually uses Bixby? We then add the ads, we, apps we want to use. We change the settings and we start building content. That's how the smartphone comes to reflect individuals and relationships. Our global comparative project then shows how these in turn reflect cultural values. A phone in Turkey shows how Kurdic society is organized around kinship, while a phone in South India might reflect the way men try and control female sexuality. To gain a sense of this anthropological perspective, take two books by my colleague Wang Xinyuan, who happens to be here. The first was called Social Media in Industrial China. Xinyuan lived during ethnography within a factory. And that factory represents 250 million people who migrated from rural areas in China to the factory system. But what her book showed is how it was the migration, the simultaneous migration from offline to online that did more to bring these people to where they wanted to go, a correspondence with China's modernity, than the move from the village to the factory. In her very recent, second, and I think even better book, Smartphones and Aging in Urban China, she turned to the middle class in Shanghai. The book reveals why you simply can't understand the smartphone revolution as it has developed for older people unless you understand the cultural revolution that they experience in their youth. Because the cultural revolution established the attitudes they bring to bear on the smartphone. So this second project was called The Anthropology of Smartphones and Smart Aging, partly as an attempt to counter the degree to which in the past we've tended to associate these new technologies with young people. We assume they're the ones who fearlessly appropriate them and make them do their bidding, while older people are seen as relatively passive and intimidated by new technologies such as a smartphone. Yet, as it happens, that's also less true in China, where older people associate themselves with the government ideal of using the new digital technologies to place China back in the vanguard of nations. So Xin Yuan could go to a restaurant and find young people complaining to their grandparents. Grandma, we took you to this special restaurant for a family meal, but you're spending all your time on the phone instead of talking to us. To take one final comparative example, what do people post when they become a mother? In England, we found that typically, um, this was Facebook, typically they, used, they replace themselves with their infant. So these are actually a series of profile pictures, the thing you see at the very top of Facebook. But it's obviously not the baby's Facebook, right? It's the mother. So the mother effectively has disappeared from her own Facebook. She's replaced herself by the infant. And that's very common in an English setting. What do Trinidadians post when they become a mother? They post images that say, sure, I have become a mother, but don't you think for one minute I am any less glamorous and out there than before I was a mother? Totally different. And you can perhaps now see why our summary volume was not called How Social Media Changed the World, 
but how the world changed social media. Incidentally, as was mentioned, all our books can be obtained as free downloads from the UCL Press, where they've already secured more than one million downloads. For older people, there is one sector, above all, that is of real importance as compared to younger people, and that is health. Not out of choice, it's as we get older, stuff happens, and you have to deal with it. Corporations know this, and the big ones are in constant competition to develop new apps that relate to health, because they're thinking about quite a lot of money they might make from this sector, which is called mHealth, across many countries. But mostly, and you can never totally generalize as anthropologists, but mostly what was striking in our work was that older people refused and resisted these bespoke apps that are being produced for their benefit by the companies. Partly because they just didn't want a proliferation of lots of apps. Now, you might think that that means that they were using phones less for their health than we'd anticipated. But no, actually, they were using their phones more for health than we anticipated. And that could be explained by another observation. What most older people wanted to do was to stay with the apps that they'd become comfortable and familiar with. Apps such as Line in Japan, WeChat in China, or WhatsApp in much of the rest of the world. Looked at more closely, we found that older people had actually been very creative and ingenious in finding ways to turn the apps that were not originally designed for health purposes into health apps. One of the most important health apps today is WhatsApp. In fact, on our website, we've published a 140-page manual on how people in Brazil use WhatsApp for health. But none of this reflected our ideas. It was based on what the ethnographer, Marilia Duke, observed people doing with WhatsApp as a means of getting and providing health information, visualizing nutrition, linking to health authorities and insurance companies, and so forth. And that was equally true for medics and for the patients. In a similar study, Alfonso Otegui worked with a chemotherapy clinic in Santiago, Chile. Now, while most people would focus on either the doctors or the patients, he could see that the key to the clinic, which were the often overlooked group, which he calls the navigator nurses, who connect the doctors with the patients. And they were the ones who quickly saw the potential of WhatsApp to make their work easier and more efficient. Again, we think of older people as the most passive recipients of new digital technologies. But when it comes to something that really matters to them, such as health, they're often the ones who actually make this transformation. In Ireland, where I was working, older people had difficulty using their health insurance app, but they would photograph the invoice, they would use social media to share it, they would find workarounds um, to basically achieve the same object. So all of this led us to develop using a phrase we took from the anthropologist Captain Peep, the idea of smart from below. That actually the people who make the smartphone smart in terms of its capacity to actually be deployed in a hundred different ways during the day is us. Now, I've already acknowledged that this depended upon those software engineers who created a device that is open to such extensive change and redeployment. Also, there is clearly a digital divide. There are people who can't afford phones, and there are many, many older people who do not have the confidence or the knowledge to use smartphones in this creative way. Yet, even in the area um, where people um, have of the lowest income where we worked, Charlotte Hawkins, who was studying, these were actually squatter settlements in Kampala in Uganda, um, there were evidence of smart from below. In that instance, the key to mobile phone use is mobile money. 
as these people have limited access to banks. At this level of poverty, any kind of illness is a financial disaster. You don't have the money to see a doctor. You don't have the money to pay for the medicines. So mobile money has become the way younger people in Kampala send money to their older relatives in the villages when they become ill. To conclude that part then, smart from below is the way we assert this claim that it is you who put the smart into smartphones. Now I started with a discussion of a conservative tradition within philosophy, but there's a lot of philosophers around there. And I want to end with a very different example, also however, from Germany. Earlier on, I implied that the idea that we focus on screens rather than people evokes terms like objectification, a term that many people would relate back to the writings of Karl Marx and the sort of negative impact of capitalism. Um, I apologize, I don't know, I know the English words, I don't know the German words, but Marx focused on concepts such as alienation, reification, fetishism, all examples of this idea of objectification none of which sound particularly positive, and certainly influence philosophers such as Adorno. But originally, Marx took this idea of objectification from the philosopher Hegel. And Hegel used these terms to present a very different scenario. Hegel saw objectification as a process that allows us to become who we are. Yes, the process starts with this self-alienation. Perhaps, let's say, the feeling that we've lost ourselves in screens rather than people. But humanity has the capacity to overcome self-alienation in a process he terms sublation. I think the German is something like Aufhebung. We come to see that these screens are created by us and used to connect with even more people. So instead of studying how people use objects, we have this sort of dialectical process. What's changing is both the people and the objects. A person with a smartphone is a different kind of human being with additional capacities. They're now in constant contact with relatives through WhatsApp. Maybe they're having an extramarital affair they might not otherwise have had because they can connect secretly or maybe they've just been caught having an affair that they might otherwise have got away with because the smartphone is often not quite as secret as we think it is. I made a short film about an Irish guy in his 70s. Um, and he was, he'd got an Oculus goggles. Um, and he was using it to travel around the Rocky Mountains, visiting markets in South Africa, places he would probably now never get to or seeing a, a VR version of a visit to a space station, a place he would definitely not have got to. A young person before going to sleep may spend an hour on TikTok or Instagram reels seeing so many things they would not otherwise have seen. Um, some that exist online, sea creatures, uh, strange cats, remote Mongolia, and things that are created through animation and similar technologies. Um, so we exist with possibilities that would not otherwise have been there. And then the smartphone becomes this process of objectification, but it's actually one that makes us more than we'd ever have been in the past. Okay, I will spare you more philosophical jargon um, and sort of repeat that point with an argument that we actually developed. Um, I, uh, I was working with somebody called Gillian Asinanen, and there's a book actually about webcam. The problem we were trying to solve is this. It does seem that every time we get a new technology, yeah, smartphones, or internet, or AI, or chatbots, or whatever, we tend to get these two genres of reaction. The first and the most prevalent will be the suggestion that there has been a loss of our fundamental humanity. In the past, we were proper human beings. But now digital media has replaced some element of that humanity with the machine. There's the idea, as I said, that we've lost attention span, or there's the superficiality expressed by the concept of selfie, it sounds like selfish, which old people, older people often say of young people, 
or the hikamori, Japanese men who date virtual women and can't face going outside to meet real women, or the, like the academic Sherry Turkle suggests somehow that watching television, which actually is a lot more passive, I would say, is somehow still more human than this, this internet. Um, the thing about all of these is they're almost invariably nostalgic. Um, the other, more muted, but almost always inevitable response is to suggest the opposite. Oh, there's a new technology, so now we are more than human. We are transhuman, we are posthuman, or something else beyond human because of our person machine combination. Now, if we're getting these two due responses every time we get a new digital technology, it's getting repetitive, if not a bit boring. So, in our book, we suggest that maybe the problem comes back to the word human. What does it mean? Because it seems to us that we do have this rather conservative definition of the human. A human being is whatever people have been up to now. But things have always changed. A human being could have been defined as a species that can't fly. Then we invented airplanes. We're now a species that can fly. In our book, we proposed an alternative, what we call this theory of attainment because we suggest that new inventions will continue indefinitely into the future. And with each new invention, we will attain capacities that we don't currently have. A better definition, then, of what it is to be human would be not just all the things we have been in the past, but perhaps all the things that we will be in the future. But we're still human. That's a rather simple language, but I think it by and large accords with at least my understanding or misunderstanding of what Hegel understood by objectification. That is, first we see things as alien and opposed to us, and then we come to realize that they are our development, as was the case in the development of law, or religion, or art, or indeed of philosophy, because Hegel certainly saw himself as a step change in humanity. Now, listening to all of this, you may have got the impression that I have a rather positive view of new digital technologies. And yes, I think it's absolutely fair to say that I am trying to create a balance with what seems to be relentless critique. But in a way, it's not really the main point I'm trying to make here through this consideration of what it is to be human. My primary point is not to adjudicate whether smartphones are good or bad, but rather try and use evidence, scholarship, to say actually what they are and what they do. Mostly, I've been putting the focus on how people put the smart into the smartphone, citing Hegel, etc. But my arguments in this talk, then, if it's they're human, would be just as compatible with seeing the smartphone as having the capacity to accentuate every negative thing that a human being is or can be. If people gamble, they can now gamble more effectively thanks to the smartphone. If people are involved in wars, then right now in Russia and Ukraine, we can see how war is rapidly developing into kind of drone-based battlegrounds often operated through smartphones. The Chinese state has always been impressively authoritarian. Think of the feudal period or the Cultural Revolution. Today, the Chinese is a surveillance state beyond any other, often using these technologies. That has to be said, I'm not sure it's quite reached the level that you had in the Cultural Revolution, which was way before the smartphone. So, what I'm arguing is that, yes, there is a lot that's positive, but one of the main reasons people tend to see my interpretation of digital technologies only as positive is that we tend to have this rather nostalgic um, idealization of an often invented past that we now regard as having been lost thanks to new digital technologies. So I'm an anthropologist. And what I've done this evening, I think, is characteristic of anthropology as a discipline. Unlike other disciplines, we're rather less involved in activities like testing hypotheses. I guess we're more like sort of academic extremists. At one extreme, we're devoted to the tiniest detail of everyday activity, spending month after month in just one community, 
looking at every single app. My new book, The Good Enough Life, discusses in detail how people keep pet dogs, how they choose their holidays, how they play bridge or sports, what it's like to be a grandparent, all very parochial. It's all about one little town in Ireland, which we then might compare with the same level of detail in one small place in Kampala or Milan. Yet we use these details and the subsequent comparisons to try and discuss the other extreme, the most general ideas about what it is to be a human being. In this case, through a direct discussion with Western philosophy. But this extremism is what allows us to develop an answer to this question of who put the smart into the smartphone. Because we don't ever see or study something called smartphones in abstraction. It's always some particular smartphone as used by an individual or within a family to do something. Play games, find a partner, buy stuff, drive somewhere, look something up. We just can't help seeing who put the smart into the smartphone because when we look through the screens of the smartphone, we will always, in the end, be looking at you. Thank you. So thanks a lot, <clears throat> Daniel, for uh, this very engaging talk. Also, the very fiery delivery. I highly enjoyed that. Uh, but it's also part of the acoustics here, right? It's really churchy. Um, <laughs> it feels like a cathedral, especially if you're behind the speakers. We can hear even less. The reverb gets even more enormous than it is already. So uh, I, I've, never, I've never felt like this. So since we're kind of in a church, Daniel, of course, we have to talk about blame. We have to talk about guilt. And um, I think you sort of started out like this when you talked about the German philosophers and to take sort of the bird's eye view now to begin this conversation. Um, would it be fair to summarize the beginning of your talk by saying that you sort of compare German philosophy, at least Kant and Adorno, to the Luddites? to the Maschinenstürmer uh, in, in history that, you know, burned that weaving machine, burned that phone. I mean, Are they to blame? Look, I don't think I needed to look very hard <laughs> at the work of these philosophers. Mm -hmm. um, you read late Heidegger's essays mm -hmm. about technology. You read Adorno about the new mass media. Yeah. I mean, Radio. they couldn't be more down on this stuff, right? They're cursing it, the rafters, in a preachy fashion. Um, and they do see it in terms of morality, very much so. So yes, I think this is, is crystal clear in an awful lot of philosophy. It does have conservatives, and as things changed, it was particularly conservatives about these new technologies. That was the joke about TikTok. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think it's there, I think it's obvious. And what, but, but what I'm saying in this talk, which is maybe a little different, is I think it still has consequences. It's mm. not just that the philosophers did it in philosophy. We look up to philosophers. We put them on a pedestal. We listen to them. And they often create the, the moral discourses that at another level we, as, you know, we espouse and we mm. talk to. So um, to answer your question, it's yes. I am yes. blaming them. Okay. <laughs> it's clear. I think you might overestimate Adorno's influence by now a little bit, I think. I think this might have, you know, been true for a long time in okay. post-war Germany, especially when it came to pop culture, which is actually my field where I come from. And yes, Adorno did a lot of damage there, but you also have to see where he came from. I mean, mm -hmm. he saw what, what cinema could do uh, as part of being a German war machine and then being part of a different war machine. He had very good things to say about radio uh, at some point, which was not the newest technology at the time, but... Uh, 
You also blamed it for the rise of fascism. But anyway. Well, blaming and not blaming, maybe that's the second point. You know, um, I thought there was a very interesting addendum in uh, the global smartphone, right at the beginning when you summarize the different chapters. You point to the fact that, I quote now, we acknowledge that we lack evidence about significant externalities such as environmental consequences, exploited labor, and the study of relevant corporations. And if you allow me to add, within this series, I would say also uh, what happened to the public sphere, because that is, of course, our main subject. There has been a recurring subject uh, in this series. So um, could not both be true? Oh, that absolutely. digital technologies can be really detrimental to all those things oh, sure. that you sort of rule out from no, your research? The, no, I, OK. And also be very useful, yes. as you told Look us. at the word externalities here. Yeah. Why am I using that term? Yeah. I'm using that term because the work that we did, did loads, but it can't do everything, right? Yeah. And there is significant and important literatures. There's, for example, a very good literature, actually by anthropologists, on things like digital labor that we don't see, mm. call centers in India, yeah. um, exploitation uh, in, in Africa, etc. There's, there's literature about the environmental consequences. There's uh, literature about surveillance. These literatures are out there. So you have to put your own work into context. So what I'm basically saying here is that I am not denying those literatures and I'm not diminishing those literatures. Mm. But wait a minute, don't you also have to study the consequences on ordinary people as you see it in everyday life? And that is not there in that literature. Yep. So there has to be, I use the word balance. And I admit that we looked at this whole scenario and said, what's missing? What actually isn't in that debate and that discussion? And our job, because we can do it in a way nobody else can, is to provide that evidence, that scholarship. Um, because to really understand everyday use, you've got to have the patience. You've got to be there. You've got to be with people. So I, what I'm basically saying is that we are not studying everything about digital technologies. Mm -hmm. We are complementing other people's studies, and those studies, for various reasons, would tend to have a more negative aspect. Yeah. Okay? Because, as I said in the talk, they tend to be the things that bear down on us, whereas I'm looking at what we do creatively with, mm -hmm. and the two meet. Let's talk about the creative part working with the smartphones, so to speak, and you use the terms of, you know, redeployment, redefining the use of a certain app and so forth. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more in detail how that actually happens? But with one problem we actually do have with apps nowadays, and the European Union is trying to work against that, is the problem of non-existing interoperability, right? That you actually, it's very hard to go from one app to another app, to change your data, to, to, uh, to migrate your data, things like that. And you said, well, what we saw, especially with old people, with health apps, when they use like WhatsApp as a health app, is they sort of redefine their use. How exactly do they redefine the yeah. use of the app? Yeah, I mean, I think the point I'm making is that the, so much of the usage that we observe mm -hmm. is not usage that seems to be envisaged by the people who created the app. So that's mm -hmm. redeployment, redeployment. So they would rather we use the apps that are specially made for that particular health purpose. They're designed for that. So I gave an example, because um, uh, you, you want a concrete example. So yep. one of the team was studying um, issues about nutritionists working with diet. And the point was that the nutritionists wanted a visual diary because if, people, if you can see what, every, what the person has eaten all day long, it's better than just having a description. And an app had been created so that you could create a visual diary for the nutritionist and people would not use it. So what the people did do is they found all sorts of aspects of WhatsApp actually combined with photography that allowed them to do pretty much the exact same thing, but with WhatsApp, because they just wanted to use WhatsApp, not the other, right? Now, WhatsApp was not designed to create a visual diary for nutritionists. 
Um, it's, that's an example of this creativity mm. that people bring to bear. They find the way that they are comfortable with, with the apps they are comfortable with, to do the self-same thing. Mm. That's the point I'm making, and that we observed all over the shop. It's a genius name, isn't it, too? WhatsApp. I think my mother thinks it's the only app existing, actually. Oh, on one of the things in Brazil is, is people think their phone is... Uh, they call the phone... In, Brazil, in Portuguese, it's called Zappy Zappy. So this is my Zappy Zappy phone. In Japan, there are plenty of people who have Line, and as far as they're concerned, it's a Line machine. Because they only use one app. That's it. That's, that's the phone. Um, just to pick another uh, concrete example from your uh, research, from your team of researchers, some of whom are present here tonight. Uh, you mentioned her already, very welcome here. Again, from my side, um, is older people in the Chinese mm -hmm. field side, right? Tend to identify with the smartphone as being, you know, it's part of their duty as citizens to actually help the country's technological advance or progress. So uh, they stand in contrast to the more general conservatism of older people elsewhere, um, I would think. So do you see different approaches across Europe there now in different areas? Or would you say, yeah, there's like there's a certain similarity there in Europe with older people being a lot more skeptical uh, in using digital technology or even people in general are a lot more uh, sensitive to data mining, for example, than they are in the US. Do you see differences across the European countries? Yes, continent? I mean, I think the, 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 I use the China example because it's the most dramatic, uh -huh. right? Um, the possibility that you have older people um, identifying with this as the project of China itself. China, that people in China want China to be the most modern state. And they feel, as you said, a citizen duty to try and, and, and you know, perform that. Now, I don't know of an equivalent anywhere else. So the differences you're going to find between, say, Brazil and Ireland are going to be more subtle, but they will reflect the differences more generally that people have in um, their aspirations as they get older. To give an example, give that example, Brazil and, and Ireland. Um, we work a lot with retired people. So in Brazil, um, people, uh, well, it's actually Sao Paulo, because Sao Paulo is different from the rest of Brazil. People are very concerned to retain the sort of identity and status they had from their working life. Mm. So they're using the phone in a way to keep that trajectory. This is who I am, and that's who I've always been, right? In Ireland, the idea is, I'm finished with work. Now let's do everything else, right? Completely the opposite. So the phone then becomes really important because they are just so busy trying out, you know, painting and chess and history and all these other activities. And one of the things about the phone is its capacity for organizing life. So in a way, it's not that they do crafts. Life itself has become the craft, the thing they are crafting their own life, that they're, you know, I want to be able to do all these things. And it actually would be very difficult even to organize them without a smartphone. So yes, very different uses of smartphone because they have different aspirations in later life. And that would be regional. I mean, I say, as I said, it depends on exactly where you are. I mean, Sao Paulo is different because it's a very work, it's a place that identifies with work. It would have been different in Rio, for example. So it's not even Brazilian. It, it depends where exactly you are. Are there differences between Ireland and England, would you say, when it um, huge, respect to that? Really? Huge differences. To more smartphone use? Sorry? Give us another insight, please. Okay. I mean, the real difference between Ireland and England is, I mean, in some ways, I think that these countries are the opposite of each other, to be honest. Okay. They're so different. <laughs> um, but when... This is when you streamed worldwide. <laughs> down okay. Down, right? okay. Um, <laughs> well, I've done, because one of the things is, when I was doing the social media project, I did 16 months in an English site mm -hmm. that was almost exactly the same size as the Irish site. Mm -hmm. So actually, I have the comparison, right? And the problem in England is that you get this extraordinary rise of isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. Remember, I also work with hospice patients. Because yeah. English people have very, particularly working class, have strong ideas about where and how you socialize. The notion, you know, have heard this notion, the Englishman's castle, home is the castle, that you don't intrude into the private domain, you meet in the public domain. And when you get older and it's more difficult, they often become very isolated. Yeah. Um, and actually a lot of my work in England was about issues of loneliness. Yeah. Um, I'm not finding that in the Irish setting at all. 
Um, there isn't that particular cultural idea about you know, where you can be with another person. Um, there is actually, if anything, an increase in sociality during that phase um, around not just coffee shops, but people coming home. And, and, um, and actually, there just wasn't an issue of loneliness. It did, basically did not exist in this site. Mm. So extraordinarily different. I mean, from a place where this is the, you know, the dominant problem to a place where it's virtually non-existent. Mm. Yes, there are differences. Mm -hmm. That's what anthropology does. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's time to open this up here. I do have many more questions, but I'm sure you do too. So we've got, we start with the live floor, I think, here, and then look at Slido, what's happening in the online sphere, right? Um, I'm a little blinded by the light, uh, as we say, but there's two microphones there. Can you show me where the microphones are? There we go. So please, we'll pass it out in front. Is there somebody in the back too that is ready to... Yeah. Okay, let's take, I think there was somebody there holding up his or her hand, I couldn't tell. Right? So pass the microphone and please pass it back to the person holding the microphone. Well, whatever. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity here. This was a wonderful talk. I'm so impressed by your work, by your ethnographic work, and especially by the cross-cultural aspect of it. This is so much work. It is. Amazing. I am. I want to ask you about one aspect of your cross-cultural work that I'm wondering about, and that is, you have been visiting all these countries that have very different political structures. So some of them are more repressive than others, and I'm I'm wondering to what extent this degree of repression is something that creates a difference in terms of the ordinary uses of. Um, of smartphones? Is it something that influences the ordinary users? I mean, the, the answer is that for most areas of ordinary life, no. I mean, if you think about smartphone use, if you're, you know, looking up about a concert, you're on WhatsApp with your family, um, you're listening to your pop music, etc., etc., um, it's very unlikely there would be a difference. But, if you come to the area of politics, then, of course, it's extremely significant. So, one of our studies was of Kurdish people in Turkey. And the situation of Kurdish people in Turkey is, let us say, difficult. And one of the points about uh, posting online is that becomes visible. So, actually, one of the interesting results of our work was that you know, a lot of people study politics as it appears on online social media. Yet we found there was much less politics than you'd expect. Because, you know, if you're looking for politics, you'll find it. But the way we do our work, we just see people scrolling through the day, and whatever is there is what we study. And the reason there wasn't so much politics is precisely because it would be problematic. Not necessarily even problematic from an authoritarian state, but politics is divisive. And, you know, you're often with your family and you don't necessarily want to have quarrels about politics. So actually, it was one of those areas that was a lot less evident in what we were observing than we had expected. Um, in some countries, that would be directly because of an authoritarian state, in others not. So the answer is, it depends on the, the form of content. Um, I would say for most forms of content, no. It's, uh, it, it's much more to do with the difference in things like family relations and kinship, etc. But there are certainly certain genres of content where the question would be absolutely pertinent and would make a big difference. My, can you and you come and, come and answer? Because I couldn't hear you. You want to make a coven because it will. I mean, be I think well, you're talking about surveillance. I mean, surveillance. yeah. I mean, I think that this has been a debate from very early on, and I think the, the most important early intervention was you probably remember when the Arab Spring developed, and everybody was saying, "Oh, you know, we have these phones, and they can be used as a vehicle for liberation. We can mobilise on the street. We can have demonstrations. We can overthrow governments." 
And then within a year, you have people like Morozov writing a book and saying, well, actually, this is how the Iranian government recognized where the distance were. This is a wonderful tool for state oppression because suddenly it's become visible. And you can act, I mean, and uh, the point about China really is that um, you are being monitored all the time. Um, when, you, when you just, almost every space you go into, people, um, you know, you have to check out your, um, your passport and other kinds of identity, et cetera, et cetera. So it has that capacity, and, and that capacity is increasing over time. Daniel, now you do sound like a speaker of our series. <laughs> I, as I said, it Didn't is take there. That long. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not denying its presence. I'm just I know. balancing it out. I know. Okay, is there somebody uh, in the back half, let's put it like that, because I can't really see that far. So if you want to say something uh, in the back, you have to raise your hand. Nope. So there's somebody up here, please. So pass the microphone here. You know what? I forgot to say, could you please stand up? Because it's a lot easier to see for the sound technicians and for everybody else. That would be very nice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Danny, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so my question is, um, there is an American author who is called um, Carl New Newport. And uh, Newport is um, a social associate professor in um, computer science in Georgetown University. Uh, so he wrote his book and he talks about, oh, the name of the book is called uh, Digital Minimalism. Um, so he argues that, well, based on his knowledge, um, the apps like TikTok and social media, TikTok or the other um, similar apps, um, they're designed for people to be addicted to that. Um, so, well, my question is, uh, so whether, based on this research, and we can arrive at arguments that even the least meaningful use or purposeless use of the ordinary people is actually still have some meaning behind it, like posting images and so on, yeah. to have an agency behind it. Thank you. Look, pretty much everything that commerce designs is designed to try and maybe not exactly addicted, but to create demand and design, but hopefully continuous. Um, television would want to, you to be watching it several hours a day, wouldn't it? Um, so there is a sense in which, in a way, that is obviously true, because otherwise they wouldn't make any money out of it or they wouldn't have any kind of influence. Um, the question is, are these things particularly different? And there has been speculation that the way the algorithm works, say, in Duyin, is kind of more effective. Um, but actually, there's two reasons why I'm not really persuaded by, by, by this. Um, the first is that the reason I think people actually continue to, you know, why do I look at Instagram reels for 40 minutes? I don't think it's because there is some kind of abstract thing out there making me addictive. It's because I actually quite like what the cats are doing. Um, and actually, I quite like these amazing underwater scenes. And I quite like these kind of different kind. I love the content. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and I think, I think this is great that I can spend 40 minutes watching amazing things I wouldn't otherwise see. Um, I mean, if that's addiction, bring it on. Uh, because actually, I think my life is enhanced by the content. And most people I know are you, you know, using these things for content. Okay? If it, they didn't have the content that attracted them, they wouldn't. And what you have to bear to balance that view is that the vast majority of things these companies try and do fail. The idea that, you know, there's this brilliant uh, genius company out there that is managing to control. I mean, it's for quite interesting, because when you go to some of these countries where, I've been, where I work, people, the, the figure they use would be Mark Zuckerberg. They say, oh, this incredible genius who's got us addicted to this, that, and the other. And I look back at the history of this. Now, Mark Zuckerberg invented something for rating babes in Harvard dormitories. People used it for something else. He insisted it should only be used in Harvard. It went to the other universities. He insisted it shouldn't be outside the universities. It went outside the universities. Almost everything that Facebook became was, despite Mark Zuckerberg getting it wrong, 
not because he envisaged all these things. And this happens all the time. Students of mine work inside these companies. Um, and work with the people that produce the algorithms. And it's most of it, so like most, if you ever worked inside a business, mostly it's a total mess. Um, and yes, sometimes they get it right and, and, and you get a connection, but it will be a connection between something they've created, like the way a particular algorithm works, and something that appeals, that actually creates a, an access to content that actually we are interested in watching because otherwise we turn it off. So I think it's a more comp th this notion of kind of it's simply they do it and again it goes back to this Adorno thing that we're just passive and we we've been you know put into this addiction. Uh, no, I just don't I just don't see it. I think capitalism and addiction is probably another evening worth of uh, um, discussion. One thing I sometimes wonder, especially on Instagram, is uh, why watch something you don't like, actually? Because many, I think many people watch things they don't like. I've, I've wrote a longish piece about the Beatles film a year ago, Get Back, you know, the 16-hour Peter Jackson. Yeah. It's a fabulous movie, yeah. actually, I think. But my feet is flooded by the Beatles, and I'm going, Paul McCartney, give me a freaking break, you know, after yeah. all these years. And it's like, I, it, it, makes me, it makes me consume it, want to consume it less, actually. Yeah. Because there's so much similarity. Uh, yeah, but you the can, th then you're very likely to switch to things that you like more, because you can. I mean, the, the, of course, the algorithm, A, doesn't always get it right. B, sometimes people, it depends what you mean by like, you know, they watch horror films and things. Do we like it? Do we not like it? Is it ambiguous? Um, and, yeah. but, but over time, we would probably, um, you know, if, if TikTok isn't doing it, I go to wheels or whatever. Um, so I don't, this idea that we have, we have become forced to watch a whole lot of stuff we don't like. Do you, I mean, you really watch a lot of, I don't watch much stuff I don't like. Um, I kind of turn over to the next channel. I think I do. I think my kids do too, but that's another question. We got something from Slido on the digital sphere. Please, Sarah, uh, can you summarize or read us the questions from Slido? Y yes, of course. Uh, this is a question from our online audience. What gets lost when using digital technologies? For example, isn't, then, is, isn't there something like an aura that gets lost when communicating digitally as on Zoom versus face-to-face? I mean, I think it totally depends on the communication. I just don't think you can ever have some big generalization about pre-digital and digital. What gets lost in non-digital communication, right? Let's start from there. Read Goffman or anybody else who actually studies the way we communicate in every day, and you will find ordinary encounters are so dominated by etiquettes about, you know, in English pub, you mustn't say anything that actually matters, right? There were so many genres and constraints. It, people have this notion that pre-digital is somehow natural communication face-to-face, -face, and digital is somehow unnatural. It's not like that at all. Both non-digital and digital have genres. Non-digital, there's the way we talk to family over meals. There's the way we talk in the office. There's the way we talk in the pub. Each has its particular cultural forms, as anthropologists would study, and they are often very tightly constrained culturally. Equally, the way we behave on Instagram may not be the way we would in YouTube or the way we would in some other platform. What we we live in a world with multiple forms of interactivity and communication. These days, yeah, some of them are online, some of them are offline. Conversations flow between the two things. I just don't think that any generalization that says the digital is this and the non-digital is that works anymore. It's too complex, it's too differentiated, um, uh, you know, even before we start to get to things like cultural difference. Is there more on Slido, Sarah? I would have one more. Okay, go please, ahead. go ahead. How does class factor into your empirical findings? Why is it that some digital technologies are perceived as a promise or a threat based on that? I mean, everything that we know about society, gender, ethnicity, class, will 
have its analogy in digital usage. Because we, as I was saying, we're human beings with these things. So let me give a negative, I, I feel I need to give a negative example. Just so you know, I can do that, right? You've given a couple already. So, so let, me, let me give you're, one you're here. Doing let me great. end with a nice negative example. I want to give you an example where the use of digital makes class worse, okay? Not just the typical digital divide, but a different one, which I wasn't expecting. So I was studying, I, I wrote an article about Googling for health information. And Googling for health information, I like, it sounds like it should be equalizing. I mean, suddenly everyone has access to the same health information. So that should overcome class differences. But I found the opposite. Why? Because what I found was that the people who had a good education, maybe been to university, they would go on Google and they would recognize which are the health information that is coming from maybe the German Health Service or the Mayo Clinic, which they could trust, which they could believe. They might even go through that and actually get access to the the scientific papers that could really inform them about these medicines. So being relatively informed, they got more informed. If you took people who didn't have that kind of educational background and were also Googling for health information, they would usually look at the first thing that came up in Google, which particularly before COVID, was either something that was trying to sell you a product or was causing anxiety because media thrives on causing anxiety. So whatever symptom you had, you were going to get cancer. And essentially, therefore, the people who, as it were, had advantage, had more advantage, the people who were already in some ways not sure about the information were more misinformed than they were before. Now, that to me is a clear example of the way the digital exacerbates class differences. And where we find that, I hope, we fully acknowledge and recognize that that is happening. Um, and then what was interesting about that case was I had not expected that at all. I just assumed it was equalizing and it wasn't. So for us, the key point is always evidence. What does the study actually show? So although, you know, I keep getting, people keep wanting me to come back to this kind of, you know, is it good, is it bad, et cetera, et cetera. I think that what we need is to go beyond that and actually do slow, patient studies of what is happening, put the evidence out there, let people assess it, and then come to conclusions based on that. And that's really what I'm trying to represent here. Okay. I'm trying again in the back. Is there somebody in the back? <laughs> Wants to, let me just have a look if there's somebody in the back, because we haven't heard anybody uh, from the back rows here, and it's, uh, it's many rows. So they really have to give me a clear-cut signal. Yeah, we got somebody. I'll come back to you later, okay? Thank you. There's the microphone, please. Hi. Thank you very much. I think it was very nice to... Uh, it's, it's a little bit confusing hear me back. Um, it was very nice to get this positive framing while digitalization is often viewed very negatively. Um, I would, however, would like to go into a more negative side, which is dark patterns. Dark patterns where the software is built in a specific way, which tries to make you buy a certain product by the way how the software is presented to you. And there's a lot of studies showing that it's actually quite effective to do that to use these dark patterns. Have you noticed that in all your studies with a smartphone or um, come upon it? My argument would be this. Of course, there any, any company that is out there is going to try and persuade you to buy their product and will use whatever technology they can. Um, we've had centuries now of advertising psychological manipulation of all kinds. Vance Packard was writing about this in the 1950s, subliminal messages that were sent to you so you didn't understand that you were actually being persuaded to buy something you really didn't want. This is capitalism. 
and I hope I've not suggested for a moment that it's weakened by the digital. On the contrary, mm. it will use whatever new digital technology it can get hold of, whatever it may be. I do not know anything about dark patterns, but whatever, it, it's plausible, I'm sure you're right, it will use whatever it can to try and increase, enhance profitability by selling a product. But it's not that that suddenly happened with the digital. The digital is, the me is a transformation in the means by which this is done. But companies were not less vociferous or manipulative before the digital. Um, they are what they've always been. And there's a range, I mean, and I don't want to over-exaggerate the generalizations about capitalism. There's all kinds of different... I mean, I've also done books about business and about capitalism. It's a very complex phenomena. There are plenty of companies out there that want to do good things, um, sell you things because they think they're really going to be beneficial to your welfare. We, we over-generalize all the time about these things. But as I said at the end of my, my talk, whatever is going on is likely to be exacerbated and transformed by the use of digital technologies. So, you know, when we're looking at bullying in the school playground, I see the ways it actually enhances bullying and also decreases it because people can see what's going on. And that will be true of selling us. So things are being commoditized and things are being decommodified as we see the digital. And we see many examples of that around us. It's never one or the other. But the, the things that are being done through the digital are being done in new ways. But why forget history? Why, why have this notion that somehow these, none of this, you know, there was no advertising before the digital? There was. Thank you. I think, Daniel, they dimmed the lights for us. I think we're, we're ready to take our hands uh, from our hats. We'll look, uh, we'll look a lot better uh, on video. And you know, nobody's going to delete it anyway. So, uh, okay, we got somebody in the third row. I'd like to comment on something before we wrap this up. Uh, thank minute, you, please. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is Do you think your reviews or let's say appreciation of technology or the smartphones would be different if you, studies, uh, if you studied youth or children, mm. not to go even to infants who, you know, we know how they use it because mm -hmm. there's quite a difference of the elders who. Oh, absolutely. Any population that you study will have its, its specifics. And any population, we could have these discussions, the positives and the negatives. But OK, let's, let's take the example, um, if you like, of children. Um, I think, from previous work I've been doing, that children actually are more susceptible, for example, to advertising than older people. And actually, there are more possibilities of manipulating them through advertising. Um, I'm saying there always was, but that can be enhanced by the digital, and, and I certainly see that. On the other hand, um, one of the, there's people like Dana Boyd and a number of other people have written about um, what's happened in terms of the way young people use digital technologies. And to tell the little story, what they argue is that, certainly in a place like the UK, um, over the last few decades, um, it's statistically, it's safer than it ever was to be a child. Um, the chances of something happening to you when you, let's say, if you were to walk to school, is actually decreased. Good evidence for that. But the assumption of parents is exactly the opposite of that. Um, whereas in the 1950s and 60s, children walked to school, now a parent would be seen as neglectful if they let their child walk on their own to school. So parents have been much more controlling over the kids' activities. Now that means they used to go out and play with each other out in the street. And now they can't. What they do is sit at home and play Minecraft through the phone with their friends. In other words, the kids are using it to bring back social activity with other kids that their parents have suppressed. And their, their parents then blame them for being too much on the screens. But it's the parents who stop them playing with the other kids, right? So if you put it in that context, yes, you can see examples where it causes issues, problems, manipulation, etc. And I've studied school bullying, for example. 
Um, and I've looked at things, you know, I, I'm trying to understand the relationship things like anorexia, bulimia, cutting, and the things that happen, the nasty things that happen in school, and how that relates to things like smartphones, etc. But that's always going to be the case with the younger people as with older people. I can tell you stories that kind of are problematic and stories which actually show the children actually achieving capacities that they were otherwise denied that we would like them to have. We would like our children to socialize with other children, play Minecraft with them. I think it's a decent enough thing for them to be doing. I really like that moving around thing here, Daniel, because as we are reminded soon enough, we won't be able to do that anymore by those other two guys there, the other two dinosaurs. So let's move around a little bit for the last question. There's so much I wanted to talk about. We have to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Um, um, so much I wanted to talk to you about, you know, about the body, something 19th century philosophers weren't very good at, to think about the body, our relation from social media to the body, about eating disorders, about best agers, uh, uh, about the rise of sports and all that, but we can't do it. Let's take another German relentless critical stance. Um, at the end, I'm not even German, but you know, I just love this negativity in this country. It's what <laughs> actually drew me uh, to move here. And if we look at the big picture again, uh, you rhetorically really nicely landed um, at a you, right? Who put the smart into smartphone? It was you. You was also the person of the year, I think, in 2007. Time Magazine has a person of the year every year. In 2007, it was you, it was us, it was the internet user in 2007. And it made me think back about all the tech utopianism in any kind of decade. It's always been about the empowerment of the user. In the 90s, it was about everybody has learned how to code, right? Mm -hmm. We all were empowered as coders. Nothing of this happened. Mm -hmm. uh, then it was like MP3. It was the distribution of everybody can be his own artist, his own gallery, his own everything. Uh, none of this has really worked out either. Then, of course, it was crypto and it was NFTs. None of this has worked out for the majority of people either. But all those sort of... Um, let's say, I wouldn't even call them ideologies, but maybe even wishes or utopias for the future have led to um, is rising inequality. Each of that utopia of the last 30 years has led to more inequality in the internet and not equality. So that's why I have this slight red alert in my head going off when I'm addressed as the center uh, of technological development, because I had been addressed as the center of this revolution for the last 30 years, and it's never been true. Um, okay, there's quite a few things there for mm -hmm. a last question. Um, inequality has absolutely risen, but to be honest, um, I would take my explanation of that from somebody like Piketty, mm. and from changes in the political economy, Mm -hmm. and from the way we understand things like asses inflation, etc., cetera, um, and the way government, you know, the problems about government. So there are many reasons for understanding how inequality has increased over the last several decades. You can read books like The Spirit Level. Piketty, I think, is as good as any. Sure. Um, not really about the digital. <laughs> it's about the political economy. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it is those... It, that's where you go to understand something like you know, things like housing and welfare and taxation systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's what inequality is really about and what it comes from. Mm -hmm. Within that, um, to take what you were talking about, about the hype, mm -hmm. um, I think what I hope I've tried to convey today mm -hmm. is that this, these imaginaries about what's going to happen, positive and negative, rarely come to be. Both sides, right? The end of the, you know, the end of humanity, or, as I said, the idea that we are coming more than human. As I said, we keep coming up with those again and again. And at the level of hype, no, most of that is never realized, whether we think it's going to create more inequality or more equality or whatever. But what we need to do is just, what I've tried to say there is get away from these vast, overgeneralized, useless discourses. Mm -hmm. 
The, the digital is this, and the digital is that, and it's good and it's bad. These teach us nothing. It's a huge field. It's changing almost every aspect of ordinary, everyday life. And what I'm trying to say is, tell me, are you talking about farmers in India? Are you talking about factory workers in China? Are you talking about Brazilian civil servants? Then, are you talking about their family life? Are you talking about how they relate to work? Are you talking about sports? What we need is sober, patient assessment of, ev of all these complex and contextual instances, because that is the actual world. So I'm just not interested in the discourses, mm. whatever they said. I want to know about the lives of people, how they experience this, the contradictions that they themselves face day by day in every little element of their lives, and bring that as knowledge so that we actually have material we can use to discuss these kinds of issues. Um, and that really was the intent today. Sure. Take, come down and be with people. And, a, and, and let's not worry so much about grand discourses. Because it's, you're right, they, they never told us much. And they ne probably never will. Nevertheless, I think it's very surprising that in the end of this very engaging talk of this evening, I highly enjoyed, I discovered a little bit of the advocate of German dialectics in the end. Something I didn't really expect at the beginning. Please, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Miller, thank you for coming out. <laughs>